Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's conversation on total cardiac replacement in the context of cardiogenic shock. My name is Brock Fenzel, and on behalf of Syncardia, the Syncardia team, and today's presenter, I'd like to start by saying thank you to all of you for making the time to join us today. Your time's valuable, and we appreciate you spending it with us. I'd also like to thank our presenters, Dr. Rame, Dr. Moraguchi, and Dr. Laskowski, without whom this event wouldn't be possible. Each one of these gentlemen brings a wealth of experience to the table and more credentials than I could hope to name in the remainder of the time that we have, so I appreciate them all being here. Having seen the uh, presentations develop over the last couple of weeks, I can tell you that each one of the presenters has put a tremendous amount of thought and energy into their presentations they're about to share with you, and I appreciate it. It's really an honor and a privilege to be able to work with such talented and passionate people. The uh, program you're about to participate in was designed to be a little bit different than the traditional didactic presentation. We'd like to center it around real patients and the path that their disease and subsequent treatment took. Uh, we recognize that the TAH is somewhat of almost a paradoxical device and that its greatest benefit to a very specific group of patients whose disease run a wide gamut of etiologies and advanced heart failure. Uh, by hearing these experts discuss how they guided their patients through their journey, the discussions uh, or the decisions that they made and the data that those decisions were based on as well as their experience. We hope that you walk away with a more holistic understanding of the patients that most benefit from TAH. Uh, we designed this program with the advanced heart failure team in mind, specific heart advanced heart failure cardiologists. Uh, but nevertheless, we think this is going to be valuable to everyone. Uh, quick note on logistics before I pass the floor to Dr. Rame, our moderator for today's event. Um, we've gone ahead and muted everybody's line and asked that you remain on mute for the duration of the call just to avoid any potential audio distractions. Um, that said, we do welcome your participation. Please just use the chat function. Um, if you look at the bottom of the window, click chat and type away. Uh, myself, the Syncardia team, and the moderators and participants will be watching the chat. Uh, for any questions or comments you may have, please understand if we don't address them right away. It's not that they're not important. It just may be that they're either going to come up in the presentation shortly, or we may be saving them for the end for discussion. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Rame and the panel. Dr. Rame. So much, Brock. Such a pleasure to be here. It's great to reinvigorate discussion around advanced heart failure with this, uh, you know, during this pandemic and so forth. But we're here with uh, uh, Jamie Margucci from Cedar sinai and Mark Laskowski from the Montreal Heart Institute. And it's going to be my pleasure to go ahead and just see how this evolves with the case discussions and the preparations of incredible slides they've had put together. My task in the next 10 minutes is just to give kind of a, let's start all on the same page uh, background uh, with some of the nuances of cardiogenic shock in today's, um, in today's uh, era. So if people can see my screen, I'll go ahead and put it into slide mode. Um, okay, so uh, real briefly, first I just want to give a historical input because it's been about 75 years, it's amazing. Um, and since I am in Philadelphia, just to be a little bit, um, a little bit, um, I guess, parochial about where some of this started, a wonderful and humble man, Dr. John Gibbon, uh, who was at Penn and also at Jefferson, he also was a resident at Mass General. This gentleman basically brought the era of cardiopulmonary bypass, really of open heart surgery, um, with the heart lung machine that was developed uh, in the 19, early 1950s. And here is the first uh, open heart surgery, and it's May 1953. And it was a young woman, an 18 year old Philadelphia um, native, who had an ASD repair under full cardiopulmonary bypass. And I just want to make sure, just so we're all in this, we're all calm. <laughs> Lots of people have um, called in. We're gonna have a great session of discussion, but look what he writes to Dr. DeBakey. You see the little scribble here on the left. It says, dear Mike, a picture of the first successful open heart surgery, complete bypass of the heart and lungs, May 6, 1953. Best wishes, Jack. And that's John Gibbon. So real quickly, fast forward 75 years, and now we're basically you know, taking for granted how many times we do bypass the heart and lungs uh, I'm just showing some recent, uh, this is actually up to 2016. Uh, so even the trend has continued on. And uh, this is actual adult cardiac uh, runs of VA ECMO. Uh, and venal arterial ECMO, as we know, is used in cardiogenic shock. But I just want to make sure we're on the same page that what happened, most likely, people say, well, what happened? How come VA ECMO exploded? What happened with temporary support? 
I don't think any of us in the field think it's a, at all a mystery. I mean, number one, the technology improved for supporting adult patients and also having more success with longer VA ECMO runs. But the real reason is because we had, other than transplant, a real bridge with LVAD and total artificial heart technology kind of coming both at a similar time point to say, you can really bridge someone. So it's a bridge to bridge approach. But as you'll see from this talk we're gonna give today with our colleagues, uh, these overviews, uh, we're gonna think of all kinds of bridges, you know, including just obviously getting someone to the total heart, um, even with uh, kind of Intermax one and two profile and seeing how that works. So you have an acute patient or acute and chronic patient with heart failure that survives cardiac arrest, now what? So we have options here to basically provide circulatory support. We have options to provide ventricular unloading. You can augment coronary perfusion, obviously with the ability to support patients with the various devices. But what we're really doing is want to define a treatment strategy. Everybody deserves a treatment strategy as soon as possible. And we, we often can't do that in our field. Uh, you got to be patient and figure out not only is this a candidate for advanced therapies, but even before that, is this guy biologically going to survive whatever you plan on doing with him or her? And I think that's the important part is this rational pathway. And you'll see, I'll put a slide of this at the end, at the very end, uh, when we finish, just so we're all on the same page and we're humbled by this, which is, it doesn't really matter currently, honestly, what strategy has been taken in cardiogenic shock. It's kind of sad. I mean, we do save lives, but if you look at data in aggregate, if you look at going back to basically, you know, era from the shock one, two trial, now fast forward with some of the more sicker patients from impress, the impressed trial with the Impella 3.5 in a very sick, all way, you know, all the more intubated population. Or you see Dr. Biswajit Carr's data from Houston. Um, look, it's it's 50%. The mortality with cardiogenic shock hovers around 50. And there is something that we have done over the last several years to make it more, more standardized, more, more uh, appropriate to jump into mechanical support. But let's just be very frank. We're not changing. There's no inflection point here. We're not changing survival yet. Importantly, if we just look at shock, and again, this is a pressure volume loop, but if we look at the paradigm of shock, when you have an acute insult that drops your stroke volume and suddenly you begin to literally charge the patient with adrenaline, of course, we have all the hemodynamic indices that all of us know about, but what we have to be cognizant of is go all the way down to the bottom. Look at the associated basically clinical phenomenon, long hospitalizations, heart failure, and mortality. Even if you're new to heart failure, you will have some heart failure after shock. We all know that. And I think that's what we have to kind of think about here more as we get to have more gray hair, like a lot of us, even if you're new in the field is, how am I gonna think about this patient beyond this month? A lot of us can get someone home, but how are they gonna do in six months, two years, five years? So bring in the shock teams, right? The shock teams now are defining all these algorithms. This is one that was developed while I was at Penn, most of the last three years. Now that I'm at Jefferson, we have a similar pathway for acute and non-acute MI. All these teams across the country, I know, I know Jamie has a team, I know the Montreal Heart Institute probably is developing or has already developed it years ago. All these teams are coming to grips with, what are we gonna do so our nurses and our fellows and our residents and all our attendings know that we're treating shock as an entity with, with timeliness and also with some kind of standardization. So this is why this field is gonna grow big time is because now we have shock units across the country that are trying to figure out what to do with these patients. So we have VA ECMO in many configurations. Importantly, what does VA ECMO do? This is an important, and I hope I'm not going through stuff that Mark or Jamie's gonna go through. Uh, guys, just nod or tell me no, so I can stop here and go to the other slides. But basically, we know that it loads the heart. It does achieve great circulatory support, and we can, for the most part, provide good oxygen uh, supply as well as perfusion, but the LV, you must be cognizant that unless you have a recovery track or a, a, a recovery pathway for that heart based on it being inflammatory or other entity that it's going to be like Taketsubo reversible, you're going to have to do more to get this heart out of trouble. So you have all these different strategies for venting. And here's just a quick illustration. Again, you're going to drop the right atrial pressure with VA ECMO, but you're going to, you're going to probably increase, if not top off the left ventricular and diastolic pressure and the left atrial pressure, as you can see there. So what happens to the energetics of the heart when you're under VA ECMO? This is just a quick slide showing that you do have, this is the pressure volume area. We highlight it there underneath. And then if you have VA ECMO, it actually increases. 
So that means that the myocardial oxygen consumption of the heart has to increase. It's the total potential energy the heart actually um, you know, uh, expends and it goes up. Now, you can unload the LV with Impella, and we have, for example, the Impella plus the VA ECMO circuit, and that has worked. But let's just be very frank. We still don't have randomized clinical trials, nor do we have data that this strategy is the best way to do things versus, say, for example, creating an, a pop-off valve in the intraatrial septum and so forth. Bottom line, here's just a nice figure that shows how congested you can be under ECMO support. Most of us know that you can't just say, oh, we're under ECMO, now let's see what happens. You have to tune, tailor, and keep optimizing patients. So why should you convert patients from VA ECMO to temporary or permanent MCS soon? First of all, we know you may have inadequate support, meaning the LV is not unloaded. So therefore you get LV distension, you get pulmonary injury, which by the way is a huge morbidity and mortality after that. And you have to be really cognizant of that. I mean, you're not mobilizing patients often on VA ECMO, and I think the most important reason, obviously you need time to determine um, what the next steps are for recovery, but let's just be frank, the most important reason is time is of the essence. This is just one slide, and I think Mark is gonna come up with, uh, is gonna show others, but you have a sweet spot. And seven days, seven to eight days, you need to start getting nervous for your patient by seven to eight days, what's gonna happen next. Um, shouldn't panic if there isn't a direct strategy, but I'll be honest, in my opinion, if you go beyond seven days, two weeks, if you're stretching that much on VA ECMO, it, it's, something is bound to happen. And this is beautifully shown in this graph. The early, obviously, mortality in the less than 48 hours, is that was more of a moratorium. Those people did not wake up. And then you have this real sweet spot of, you know, basically up to about seven days. So someone's on VA ECMO. What next? It's important to realize that we basically have some trick some tricks of the trade that we've learned all as colleagues. Um, we know the RV cannot be fully assessed. You have to turn the ECMO circuit down. And even then, really, I've learned from a lot of surgical colleagues, you really have to almost turn it down, down, down to see what the RV is really gonna do below 0.5 liters. And you can't often do that in the ICU unless the nurses start yelling at you. <laughs> um, so at the end of the day, you have to be cognizant of the limits of what you can do on VA ECMO in your assessment. But the other thing is, obviously, you. You try to you know, look for the best uh, strategies for recovery, but myocardial recovery may not occur because of what we talked about as far as venting. So again, this is courtesy of David McGiffin. He is a wonderful colleague from uh, the Alfred in Australia. He gave me these slides. Here's just a pathway that he takes. He looks to see, obviously, okay, you got someone who just had cardiogenic, who's in cardiogenic shock after resuscitating him. What do you do next? You try to revascularize him, then you look at, obviously, um, you know, revascularize them safely with percutaneous strategies, and you look for the different strategies to either recover or bridge to advanced therapies that may be either heart transplant ultimately or destination uh, with LVAD. But in each of these strata, let's just be clear, we have palliate patients sometimes. Sometimes they don't make it, and that's why you got to choose well and choose timely. I think the one thing I'm going to take home from today's session I want to hear from others is you got to be timely. Um, so here's, here's again in their, in their own center, let's say you go down this pathway and you're basically, um, you're basically at a point of, of, you, of needing tandem, um, uh, you know, by, by sided tandem support or center back support or VA ECMO, the transition in their center is within a week. And this is what David has done. So we know this from the Columbia experience, it's used across the world, the center mag, um, can be used as a surgical technique to go ahead and have patients or mobile from VA ECMO. This is a by-sided approach, but clearly it's important to think that there may be patients when you do not have certainty of what's going to happen recovery-wise. And what I mean by that is you really don't have faith that the substrate you're dealing with, because there's either ventricular arrhythmias, there's infiltrative cardiomyopathy, there is evidence of a long-standing an irreversible refractory cardiomyopathy, you're going to have to bite the bullet sometimes and say, we're going to go for cardiac replacement and a cardiac recovery. So finally, I'm just going to say, as far as recovery, we know there it's possible even under LVAT support, but this data that we are writing up that should be coming out in circulation soon from restage clearly isn't patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with, with, within five years of having heart failure, we excluded more than five years out of having heart failure. And these were patients less than 60. This is a select group. 
And yes, we were able to get these EFs up and we had a good explantation rate and we'll see what the long term is. But just to be really humble, we looked at our data at Penn as far as how we did with ECMO weaning. How long can these patients survive and how, they, and how well do they do? So we defined successful weaning as those patients who were actually more than 48 hours and were doing fine on ECMO and then needed to be um, you know, trialed for weaning. And here's our data basically for these patients that were able to be uh, that, that were able to be successfully weaned, we had survival to discharge in 64%, overall one year survival again 54%. If you look at actually this group, and this is the group that actually went home, yes, they if you get home, you're likely to maybe be okay in the next year. But if you look at the overall group, comparing patients that went on to LVAD or heart transplant, we didn't have anybody in the VA ECMO here go on to TH at Penn, but we had LVAD or heart transplant you do better with LVAD or heart transplant than if you look long-term at these patients that were actually able to be um, recovered. So in summary, again, we'll go back to this slide. 50% is what we see as the current still, it still hovers the mortality around 50%. And I just want to thank my colleagues here now that I'm working with, Todd Massey. We have a terrific shock team here with some colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Al Rawas and uh, Alec Vishnevsky and Priti. And I want to just, an intellectual debt to my colleagues and uh, still a very good friend of mine, Christian Bermudez and Ali Banayosi. Thank you. I think now we're going to present um, cases. I think the first person that is coming uh, to speak right now is Dr. Jaime Moriguchi, who is the head of MCS at Cedar sinai And he's uh, just a longstanding, wise, one of the wisest people uh, in our field, and I say wise because he's like John Kobashigawa. We don't know their age, uh, but they age well. But jo but uh, Jaime is an incredible colleague, and he's going to go through some cases uh, followed by Dr. Liskowski. Thank you. Oh, I need to. Uh, there you go. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> can you see my screen, uh, Eddie? Yes. And you can hear me okay, right? All right, good morning, everybody. I was asked to um, share one of our cases that uh, we found quite fascinating, and I hope you do too. And um, I really wanna thank Sincardi for allowing me to present uh, this case, and hopefully it'll stimulate some lively discussion toward the end. So this first, um, hold on a second. not working. There you go. Okay. So our first case involves a 22-year-old uh, female from Lompoc, California. If you don't know where that is, about 120 miles north of Los Angeles. She's uh, blood type O, 5 foot 2 and 130 pounds. BSA is 1.52. <clears throat> she had excellent health really until the 3rd of uh, um, April. This is back in 2018 now. Just remind, keep yourself reminded about that. And she had a, um, her first pregnancy and it had to be induced at term because of eclampsia. Prior to that, she had no medical or cardiac history. She actually did fairly well initially, but over the next six weeks, she gained approximately 25 pounds with diffuse edema, almost anasarca, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and orthopnea, and presented to an outside facility in Lompoc with a pressure of 65 over 40. They were able to put, place a Swan-Gans catheter in her and she had an RA pressure of 25, PA pressure of 35 over 24 with a mean of 28 and a wedge of 25. Her cardiac output and index were 2.1 and 1.4 respectively. Lactate was elevated at seven. She had a transaminitis and her creatinine was 1.0 and she was quite oliguric and overloaded. Um, if you calculate the CPO, cardiac power um, output, it was uh, 0.23, which is very low. and a, PA uh, pulsatility index of 0.44, also very low. And she had escalating inotropes and uh, urgent call was made to Cedars and we transferred her within uh, 48 hours um, when the bed was available. She was on maximum dose epinephrine, level fed, basal present and dopamine as well as an IV Lasix drip. She remained hypotensive with central cyanosis, altered mental status, and actually had a seizure requiring intubation and um, we'll discuss the severity of her uh, shock, but it was pretty obvious. We performed an echocardiogram, which I'll show you in just a second, but it showed a low ejection fraction on the left side and moderate depression on the right side with two plus MR and TR. 
She also had a right lower lobe uh, infiltrate, which turned out to be a pulmonary infarct and possible secondary pneumonia. And uh, because of her uh, mental status, she had a head CT scan, which was negative. <clears throat> Here's the echo, the parasternal view on the left demonstrates pretty, it's, the, the, the dimension was 5.1 centimeters in diastole, but you can see that the ventricle is pretty diffusely uh, and severely hypokinetic. The right ventricle was also involved, but not as severe. I'd say it's not the moderately uh, depressed. And um, obviously she was in a lot of trouble. So the first thing we did, of course, was um, have to decide what to do about her. She's critically ill. We did, obviously, this is a decision point, and the uh, different options include continued inotropic support, which was already on maximal therapy, consider temporary MCS, uh, balloon pump, Impella, CMAG, VECMO. These all were things that we thought about versus a durable MCS or uh, LVAD versus bilateral HVAD or even a TH. Go straightly, straight to transplant and we had not worked up for that, or withdrawal comfort measures. Now, this is a 22-year-old who just had a baby, and obviously the last wasn't even in our uh, consideration. We elected to place a 5.0 uh, impella to her right axilla, and initially there was uh, some flow improvement. Uh, we did not have a swan because of her pulmonary infarct, and, um, but she didn't do too well. That was on the 24th of um, uh, May. And basically within 24 hours, we had to place in a uh, protect dual, which is a catheter that is dual lumen through the right internal jugular vein and place a tandem. So we had both right and left percutaneous ventricular support. And she finally turned around hemodynamically with that with better urine output, we were able to wean off her drips. And um, she was by a week later, she was actually sitting up in bed. Uh, this procedure, we uh, <laughs> decided to name Tandela which is an impella on the left side, tandem Arben on the right side, kind of like Cinderella, I guess. And basically she um, looked really good, was handling a unit, but she could not leave the unit, obviously. Over the next month, we actually spent um, getting her better nutritionally and ambulating the hall, which will um, be an important point as we discuss later. And unfortunately, she was found to be quite sensitized. Her PRAs were above 85% uh, plus one, and Similarly, class two. So she received rituxan and IVIG. And um, during that time, we optimized her status uh, in hopes of doing a transplant. Now, remember, she had a um, presumed postpartum or possibly viral cardiomyopathy. So we had hoped that she would recover. So we had placed the percutaneous devices to give her time for ventricles to recover. Unfortunately, um, by July, which was um, nearly, uh, well, that was almost a month and a half neither ventricle improved by echo and she failed weaning on several occasions. Unfortunately, the impella pressure, purge pressure started to increase and subsequently the current increased. And on day 43 of uh, biventricular support, percutaneous support, her impella acutely failed leading to a cardiac arrest. Fortunately, our surgeon was near, nearby and on, at the bedside right after CPR placed peripheral VA ECMO, which um, saved her hemodynamically. The patient was ta then taken to the um, operating room for impeller removal, which had a big clot on it. And she was felt to be Intimax 1 uh, TCS at that point. She was neurologically intact and thank God she was young. Her liver and kidney remained stable. She was relatively small with a BSA of 1.5. Uh, we considered a, a total artificial heart, but with a CT scan showing uh, eight centimeters uh, transverse diameter at the T10, she, we didn't think 70 cc could uh, fit and she was unfortunately also Medicaid, so they don't normally approve for uh, total artificial hearts. But we kept trying and we had to decide what to do for her whether we should exchange for a new Tandela, put bilateral CMAGs, which requires sternotomy, go straight to transplant, or consider a TH if we can get approval. And miraculously, of course, um, on the 12th of July, Medi Cal approved after much, uh, many telephone calls to the regional uh, field center in Sacramento, and we, are, we implanted a 50 cc TH in her. And uh, she was found to have a lupus anticoagulant, factor V light and mutation, and she was covered with heparin and did not have any major thrombotic or embolic episodes. This is the patient on July 24th. So this is several weeks after the TH. 
and she was sent to the floor and um, starting to ambulate and again improving her nutritional status and strength. Uh, most is uh, all her drips were weaned off and she was we felt ready to go to transplant. And again, we had to decide with a center status 1A, but she had already been in the hospital for over two months. And we had to decide whether to let her go home for psychological reasons uh, versus keep her in the hospital. At that time, we were still in the old system of uh, you know, prioritization. So if they went home, even with a TH, there would be 1B instead of 1A. And we thought the better part of that was just keep her in the hospital because she lived all the way in Lompoc. So on the 20th of August, a suitable donor was identified for her. And this was hospital day 88 and post um, TH day 38. And the surgery was quite difficult and as you would expect, quite bloody and we left her chest open for a day. But she, uh, she then stabilized out and we had done some special preparation when we put the TH in to make this, T, uh, this transplant a lot easier, which we can talk about later. But she got uh, the TH and was discharged home within 10 days. And I just called her um, phone and she and the baby uh, about a week or two ago looked great. And this is a picture of them uh, a couple months ago. So this is the case that um, we presented. We thought it was an amazing um, case of someone who was extremely sick. And uh, these are the different uh, issues that came up. It was a case of severe cardiogenic shock with potential reversible ideology and a recent PE. It involved management of biventricular failure using a temporary MCS device, uh, namely a Tandela and a very small patient, BSA of 1.5 and small LV. And the significance, which um, Dr. Rame referred to earlier, was that we use VA ECMO and how to manage that as far as timing and exit and venting strategies. And then, of course, the successful use of the 50cc TH, which, as you know, is now commercially available and FDA approved in a highly sensitized individual. And the most important thing is that there was stepwise management and everything had to go perfectly well for us to achieve a successful transplant outcome. But um, it did happen and we're extremely uh, thrilled about the results. And that's why I'd like to share that patient with you. There's several, several of the key takeaway points before we open up the discussion is that the patient had cardiogenic shock, obviously, but cardiogenic shock, like everything else, is a real spectrum of diseases from, you know, somebody who's hypotensive and on a dopamine drip versus someone as sick as she was with uh, end organ involvement, um, lactate going high, right heart cath demonstrating a very poor CPO and PAPI. And if you had to stage her for risk stratification, she would definitely be stage D in the SCAI uh, nomenclature and I am pro, uh, Intimax profile one TCS. So she was sick of six and her survival expected less than 40%. And certainly if we didn't intervene, it would have been 0%. We also stressed the importance of temporary MCS, which in this case was um, necessary because we wanted to see if her heart would recover. She had just presented with uh, several weeks of this uh, uh, acute decompensation and it's possible that some of these patients would recover. So we use a temporary device instead of a TH, of course, to start off. And then you have to consider like the duration of support and how long these uh, devices will actually work before you run into trouble and whether or not she's a transplant candidate. It also buys you time to determine whether or not she's a candidate or not. And then, of course, you must know all the associated complications related to these devices, including hemolysis, infection, and stroke. Then, of course, um, we talked a little bit earlier about VA ECMO. Once it goes in, it can save you from, you know, um, cardiac arrest. And um, you can do it while they're doing CPR. So it does um, hemodynamically uh, rescue the patient but then you have to develop exit strategies because within seven to 10 days, the complications associated with that are quite high. Do you go straight to transplant from VA ECMO? You need to know what your center's uh, results and success rate is or bridge to bridge like the TH. And of course, when you use a durable device, you have to decide whether LVAD versus TH is indicated. Usually patients with NMX1 profile that's sick do not do well with the LVADs alone and um, or you have to get them into a better state before you can use it. And often this would be a perfect role for a TH. That's basically it. It's fantastic, Jamie. Jaime, that's amazing. Amazing case. Um, amazing the duration of support, right, for the lady uh, in terms of you guys were patient to look for recovery. I think you told us about what, about day 40, was it day 45, 46, when she had the event uh, with 
her no longer flowing um, on the impella? Yeah, the impella was in for uh, 46 days of support. And you know, our longest is I think 50 days, but usually beyond two to three weeks, we start watching for evidence of uh, failure. And the purge pressure is su suggestive, but when the current goes up, you're in trouble and you need to change it. We were about to change it when she arrested. We have one question from Claudio Bravo, but I just want to ask regarding that event, did you have any hints prior to that event where she arrested because of the failure, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the, um, you know, the support uh, dropout? Did you have any hints that she could do that as far as anything that led to you thinking she could be, have some thrombotic proclivity um, or anything prior to that? Uh, at that time, we didn't know she was um, somewhat hypercoagulable. At least the uh, studies for that had not returned. But, okay. um, you know, once our perch pressure starts going up, uh, we, we have a concern that there's a clot in there or there's something going to happen to the device. Um, and then at that point, when the current goes up, um, we're 90% sure something's going to happen in the next 48 hours. So um, not always, but we're, we're sure. But everybody's a little concerned about taking her to the OR. She's so sick. And we could never wean off the, either the LVET or the RVET for that matter. So, you know, unfortunately, we waited probably the wrong move because she arrested. And luckily, somebody was there and uh, put a peripheral ECMO and she did well. And the device had a big clot on it. Uh, so that yeah. luckily didn't go, you know, to the brain. The, the, uh, there's two questions, so we have actually several coming in. So Claudio Bravo, what, so Claudio asked, what do you think about BIVAD with either HeartMate 3 or HVAD versus TH? Said, Probably this patient is too small for HeartMate 3, but how about HVAD, BIVADs? Um, I'm just gonna make one comment, Jamie, that is, you know, the fact that she had thrombosis, thrombotic proclivity, I think that already for a lot of us, we've been able to support patients on bi-sided uh, heart uh, HVADs. The problem is the RVADs, even when in the pulsatile area, do clot. And, um, and I wonder how the durability in some of these patients who have thrombosis uh, would be. And then there's the issue, of course, of, um, of how surgeons feel about you know, that kind of configuration. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on that? So we've done three um, bilateral HVADs. Obviously, you know, it's not, it was not FDA approved for the right side. Um, two of them did well, but because we transplanted them, well, one of them did well because we transplanted them pretty quickly. The other ones who went home, um, one of them had a uh, pretty big event about a year or two out, and the other one also had a stroke. So I don't, I'm not a real big fan of bilateral HVADs, and I don't think that's the right thing for this lady. She was very tiny. Uh, Centromag bilateral would have been the only other option I would have considered. But again, you know, it, you still leave in the ventricles, which are not moving, and a great source for clots. And then you have other issues involved with infection. So, you know, I have to still crack her chest. If I'm going to do that and I can get a TH and especially at 50 cc in this small lady, um, that's what I would have done every time. And that's what, that's the only thing that's going to save this lady. Great questions are also coming in now, Jamie and uh, Mark, you can weigh in here. There's a question from uh, Dr. Broad. Uh, would it have been beneficial to start with the total official heart rather than biventricular support prior to ECMO? Um, in other words, that whole period of biventricular support, that's a great question. And then we have another question, uh, just, just I'll follow up real quick. The second question is from uh, a participant that asks, was she already a transplant candidate at the time of the TH? Uh, did you have to uh, cross any antibodies uh, or use, uh, like John and you guys sometimes use uh, echolizumab to get her to transplant quickly? Oh, those are excellent questions, but, and it crossed her mind. But at the same time, remember, she was not, in Medicaid uh, patients, Medi-Cal patients on, in California, they're, they're covered uh, and you have to get approval for that because Medi-Cal does not cover THs. So that's one problem. And spent, us a, spent almost a month of calling um, Sacramento frequently to talk to them and finally got them to approve it on the 12th of July. The second thing was, you know, when we first put the, to, um, the uh, bilateral percutaneous fads in uh, when she was real sick, we wanted to buy time. One is to see if she's a candidate for transplant Two is to, when we found out the antibodies, we needed to treat her, so we needed a month for that. And so, you know, and then we also, because it's a recoverable etiology, wanted to see if the heart was gonna come back. So that's why the percutaneous fats seem to be the best choice for her. And, you know, unfortunately, when you use those devices, you have to know that after about three to four weeks, the risk of uh, failure can occur. So that's why you gotta know your devices. And we were concerned. Uh, luckily, we got away with uh, ECMO as a bridge to transplant. Uh, we don't like to go directly from ECMO to transplant, which is another option we could have done because our survival is about 50 or 60%. Uh, 
Um, but the ones that do well is actually a young person like this. The problem is because the antibodies, we thought we we're going to have to wait a lot longer. So we put the uh, TH in. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a great case. Um, for the sake of time, I think also Mark uh, just. Uh, is going to be able to present maybe two cases of maybe more of a different timing as far as the TH. Jamie, you have another case as well? Or that's... Um, no, no, that's it. That's the only one. Okay, Mark, go ahead. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you. Hey, thanks a lot. Uh, everyone was a great, uh, great case. Uh, I think what we're noticing is uh, everybody has a different uh, type of range of cases and every case seems to be different. And I think we, it's tough to rely on data because there's not much data out there, but I think we have to rely on your local reality. You know, what are your transplant stats? What are your surgical, what's your surgical experience? And you have to go a lot with that. So, um, so I'm a cardiologist in advanced heart failure and an ICU doc at the Montreal Heart Institute. Um, this is our new center that we're building right now. They'll have 60 beds of uh, cardiac critical care uh, nature. Hopefully to expand our process, our progress. Uh, so, you know, there's a case of refractory shock that I'll talk about here. And obviously there's a lot of patients that have limitations to referral and or transplantation, uh, either acutely or, or sort of uh, medium term. So you're kind of stuck with uh, maybe some you know, patients with Intermax uh, one and two that need acute support. Uh, and then once you get to that and you see who survived, then you have to decide what's your exit strategy if they're not potentially transplantable in the short or medium term. So as we mentioned before, and I'll show a couple of, uh, a couple of articles as well that sort of uh, talk about this uh, window of opportunity sort of in the four to 10 day range if you're on uh, um, temporary uh, percutaneous support or ECMO. Uh, you know, and then all the benefits to go with uh, being able to have uh, a good hemodynamic support where you can clearly reduce the catecholamines and vasopressor use that obviously uh, have direct side effects and can actually potentially contribute to worse outcomes. You can mobilize patients early if they do have implantable devices uh, and obviously give a chance to uh, bridge the transplant in otherwise acutely untransplantable, untransplantable patients. So cardiogenic shock obviously have a huge complication rate up front from the fact that they're just in the circulatory shock and you have to be able to reduce that component by using either uh, inotropes uh, and or temporary support. Uh, but then you have this whole problem of, you know, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, potentially sepsis that adds itself onto it. The longer you're uh, supporting your patient with uh, uh, percutaneous uh, temporary support. So I think there's every patient's a bit different and every patient will have a different window of opportunity. And I think that's the importance of your shock team to have an established plan on up front and be able to within just a few days or the following day uh, change plans if you see uh, an opportunity or a closure of an opportunity that may long, no longer be there. Typically from the data out there, we assume about sort of six to eight percent complication rate on intemporary support, uh, about six percent infection rate per day. So I think uh, you know, up front, you got to see if the patient gets better. Uh, and later on, you have to make sure that he doesn't exclude himself for any secondary plans because they develop more complications. So I have four cases and it seems like the last, uh, the last 10 uh, total large full hearts we did, seems like every case was a bit different. Uh, here are four different ones that we sort of uh, that went through uh, all successfully. So a case of a lady with incessant VT, a patient with a huge uh, post-infarct VSD, patient with acute humeral ejection and already a transplant patient for a couple of years uh, that's been progressively getting worse and all of a sudden she really became unstable. A uh, patient with severe biventricular non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and a younger man. Um, and, you know, the strategy initially for a lot of these patients, you know, when we look at them as, with our heart team uh, is to see sort of what is, what is the, what's the diagnosis, what's your acute support needed upfront to be able to save this person. Uh, we use often the save score before putting an ECMO to see if they're going to survive. Even we do put uh, an ECMO device or other type of temporary support device in to see if it's uh, worth even going ahead. So case one here, we had a patient with uh, incessant VT after a huge anterior MI. Uh, they even we tried an ablation that didn't work, but clearly she was so unstable. Uh, she ended up on uh, ECMO. And this was sort of in the context of someone who we had to decide quickly what is her transplant uh, candidacy. She was uh, LVAD ineligible because of her current VT, uh, 180 pounds. She found, she found her to be quite highly sensitized from prior childbirth. So we knew given her local stats that she's not uh, immediately transplantable. So we didn't want to keep her on ECMO uh, at this point for any type of prolonged amount of period um, because obviously immobility, the risk of complications uh, and so on. Second case, patient as well who was on ECMO after a huge uh, VSD form post-infarct. Uh, it was deemed non-repairable because of the size. It was really from apex back to the base of the heart from a huge anterior MI. Um, 
accused on uh, ECMO as a bridge to, uh, bridge to bridge the decision uh, to see if he was able to recover from the shock. Uh, he was at this point a big guy, 230 pounds, obviously blood group O to make her life easy. He had multi-organ failure up front uh, that actually was able to improve quite substantially after 10 days of support. Um, and then we're like, okay, fine, we can lift him tr for transplant, but how long is this guy gonna wait? And given our local stats, we had to really ask ourselves a question, you know, what is our, uh, what is our mean transplant time for a person like this? Uh, and even status four, which is sort of I equivalent, I think uh, your status 1A, um, you know, it might still take a few weeks. So we weren't necessarily gonna keep them uh, uh, at this point. Uh, our group tends not to, uh, to do uh, upper extremity biventricular support, uh, percutaneous bi biventricular support. I think we tend to go directly more towards TAH because um, we have a lot of experience with that. Uh, but again, the points the these two last cases where you have someone ECMO support and you have to decide, okay, what's your plan B? How do you get them to transplant if they survive uh, acute uh, hemodynamic stabilization. The other approach we have with a couple of patients is that they're not on ECMO and uh, maybe that's not necessarily the thing they need at this point. Uh, we had a lady who was transplanted a few years ago. Uh, she pretty bad uh, uh, course of events. She ended up with uh, PTLD and with chemo complications from that bowel section. Uh, ended up losing her kidneys from severe cardiorenal syndrome from progressive uh, restrictive uh, cardiomyopathy from a chronic humeral and topped off with a sort of acute uh, humeral process. Uh, and at this point, she had severe biventricular dysfunction, refractory cardiorenal syndrome, which was being on, dialyzed on CVH at that point from low cardiac output rest restrictive physiology uh, type of hemodynamics. Uh, she had an elevated PRA and we did put a bortezomib um, uh, plasmapheresis um, desensitization protocol. Uh, and at this point for her, you know, she was uh, awake, uh, sitting in her chair, getting uh, dialyzed, talking to us, not intubated. Uh, and we clearly knew that, you know, what was our, what was our plan to get her to transplant? Because we deemed she was re-transplantable. She was 42 years old, uh, motivated, had a good so uh, psychosocial um, uh, environment to sort of uh, get her through this. And she clearly wasn't an LVAD or an ECMO uh, option at this point, because we wanted to sort of uh, get her through the best uh, bridge to transplant uh, decision. Then we have a case number four, which is the same thing. A patient who's not on ECMO or PVAD presents with severe biventricular bi dysfunction. Uh, ejection fraction is, you know, five to 10% in a 36 year old guy. A huge atria, uh, most likely sort of a process of already on biopsy, sort of a, a more um, sort of a chronic, acute on chronic decompensation. So something that's not gonna recover. It wasn't like a myocarditis or otherwise. Clearly intermax too at this point in the ICU and escalating doses of inotropes, uh, obviously limited by non-sustained VT. Uh, vasopressor doses were increasing, worsening cardiovascular syndrome. So our group sort of decided, okay, so what's our exit plan? Does he need acute hemodynamic support? I think he was getting worse. And I think we had to decide within the next 24 hours what to do with this guy. Uh, and then we looked at, is this guy transplantable, transplantable in the short term? Uh, big guy, blood group O, PRA negative. But uh, given our, our local uh, availability of, uh, of big donor hearts, uh, you know, this we had a couple of patients, they waited up to uh, six months uh, to get a, uh, an over 250 pound uh, donor heart, especially blood group O. And he was in the LVAD options, his RV was completely shot. Um, so we had to make decisions to where to go with this person. So we have a lot of these patients to come up with uh, significant barriers to transplantation. You know, if they are deemed to be survivors in their acute process, uh, we have uh, size and weight uh, constraints. We have blood group com constraints, their group O, uh, sensitization. Uh, instability of worsening organ function. So they are getting worse either very quickly or they're just not great with multi-organ dysfunction that hopefully is gonna recover, um, that allows some more options. Uh, if they're not eligible as a bridge to transplant with an LVAD because the RV is no good, or if there's another process like uh, uh, recurrent VT or huge VSD. Uh, and then patients obviously who are deemed, uh, therefore Intermax one or two, and not deemed as a bridge to transplant, a bridge to bridge candidate uh, uh, with, uh, with an LVAD. So if you look at the data, and I think there's, there's a lot of data saying obviously earlier is better, uh, although you have to triage the patients who will not survive. So uh, a lot of the chart, a lot of the graphs and the data do suggest that, you know, most of your deaths are typically upfront when you do uh, take a cardiogen critically cardiogenic shock patient and you put on ECMO or some of other perf uh, peripheral support. A lot of the patients will die upfront. So I think that's an unfortunate triage that necessarily happens from patients who end up with the either big strokes neurological process after cardiac arrest or multi-organ dysfunction. 
so the people that would die no matter what pass away within the first uh, four to five days. And then if you sort of look at the potential outcomes afterwards, so we know that there's a high mortality upfront, and this is a curve, sort of a, a probability of survival over the course of the first few uh, weeks on, uh, on ECMO. And we try to extrapolate, uh, you know, what is the potential survival of a patient with, over the course of this process. So upfront, there's a high mortality just because we're probably too late, there's a complication, or he goes into refractory multi-organ failure and he's not gonna, it's gonna die no matter what we do. Then you have the patients that start to get complications of being in the ICU with multiple anatropes, vasopressors, percutaneous support. They're intubated, they get septic, uh, they get blood clots and have strokes. So obviously if you wait too long as well and percutaneous support, you start to end up with a lot more complications. So there's a, there's a pretty narrow, although it depends on who your patient is, uh, you know, window of opportunity. And I think that clearly starts as early as day, uh, you know, three to four or five, where you can start to see, you know, who are the survivors who are starting to turn around what patients are starting to urinate or renal function starts to improve, those who were not infected yet, uh, and those who give you at least three to four days to decide whether they're transplant candidates. So, you know, if you look at infection risk over time, any person in the intensive care unit, which is uh, either bed bound or intubated with multiple lines to be infection free, uh, you know, that probability goes down quite substantially over the course of uh, just a number of days. So usually about a 6% infection rate per day on ECMO intubated so, you know, you can't wait too long because you'll get a huge pneumonia and you're septic and then you kind of miss a window of opportunity. And we know as well from, uh, from a lot of the data out there that uh, a large part of what we're doing to patients with high-dose catecholamines is potentially worsening their outcome. I think we're compromising perfusion to vital organs, especially the gut. Uh, and if we know that we lose the gut, then obviously the patient goes into refractory uh, uh, distributive septic shock and the patient goes into multi organ failure. So the inotropes we use to keep them afloat are clearly bad. And I think that a lot of the data suggests that if you can wean off the inotropes as much as possible with, uh, with full adequate uh, support, I think that's your best option to allow the patient not to get all those complications. Because uh, we know that vasopressors can reduce organ perfusion. They increase the risk of arrhythmias. They deplete ATP and whatever to myocardial con contractility. So your LV function actually gets worse. Uh, you have all the catabolic uh, effects of catecholamines. Uh, increase uh, the risk of uh, uh, infections and otherwise you have immun immunomodulatory effects. So bottom line, just to keep someone intermax three or two by slamming him with inotropes and beta suppressors is clearly not a good option. And then once you have the patient on some kind of percutaneous temporary support, let's say your center is not uh, uh, comfortable or experienced enough to put uh, upper extremity uh, percutaneous uh, unilateral biofringicular support, uh, they're on, you know, they're on femoral, femoral femoral support in a patient who uh, could not be extubated for whatever reason. Um, then obviously you have all the uh, potential harms of prolonged immobilization, all the cardiovascular, respiratory, neuromuscular, and other risks of being prolonged uh, in, a sed in a sedation intubated process. And obviously the burden of clinical illness as well will have its impact on the patient. So you end up with a lot worse uh, transplant candidate just after a, couple of, a few days to a couple of weeks than if you're able to get the patient up and running and moving fairly, fairly early. So a lot of our patients typically end up like this. They get uh, you know, VV ECMO, which is our quickest way to get them on a full cardiopulmonary support, but obviously they're uh, highly instrumented and it's tough to mobilize and wake up these patients and obviously they're gonna be bed bound. Uh, and you know, in the long run, you get patients that are you know, chronically critically ill, that are myopathic, that sometimes do tracheostomies, uh, uh, tube feeding, and you know, this is not necessarily the patient you want to transplant uh, up front, right? Because he's going to have a long road ahead with a high risk of complications perioperatively of his transplant if you even assume he's transplantable at this time. And then after that, once you transplant him, then it's a long road down after that. After that, uh, and he might get other secondary complications like you know pneumonias and bed sores and, uh, and other things that you try to avoid. And in general, the you know the, the quality of life of these patients is is pretty miserable. Although, you know, it could take up to a year or so for them to actually uh, end up uh, out of the hospital. Versus if we take a fairly upfront, quick approach to uh, more durable support. And uh, as I was mentioning earlier, in all our patients that clearly were transplant candidates, but whom, you know, an LVAD was not their option for durable support, uh, then we're pretty quick in the draw to go uh, with our heart team to decide for a total artificial heart. To be able to exactly like this person here, he's... Uh, He's um, one of the patients with severe biventricular dysfunction uh, who got a total artificial heart up front. Uh, within three days, he was already extubated and moving. You know, and this could have been a patient who could have stayed on ECMO for, for a week or two or three waiting for a heart transplant. 
So clearly we got a better outcome and he got transplanted successfully and was out of the hospital within two weeks. So, you know, make sure you evaluate your exit strategy for refractory cardiogenic shock patients, especially the Intermax one, two, threes. Uh, have an exit plan for some kind of uh, durable support or even palliative care if you decide if you decide he's transplant candidate or not. Um, if the patient is on ECMO, uh, the TH exit strategy implant might sort of become a bit more concrete and then feasible as of day four. So all the patients that were going to die, no matter what you do, will typically pass away within those first uh, three four days, uh, and then you have this window of opportunity uh, before they start to get ICU complications, sort of day four to ten, as all our other. Um, panelists were, there, were mentioning earlier. You know, upfront TH, we do that from time to time as well. And patients uh, that I mentioned up uh, earlier as well that are deemed transplant candidates, if you have enough time to assess that they are candidates at that point fairly quickly, uh, but they're clearly not LVAD candidates, so there's no other bridge. We try to avoid an ECMO as a, as a bridge to transplant. Uh, then we go for upfront TH. Uh, with fairly good results. And obviously if the patient can literally walk into the OR, then he's gonna you know, walk out of the OR with his TH and have a pretty good outcome. You know, if you can get him off the catechol means uh, fairly quickly, if you, and all the benefits of early mobilization of the TH allows you to have a much better transplant candidate, uh, shorten hospitalization, length of stay, improve uh, outcomes. Uh, and using the strategy, uh, just in our last uh, 10 uh, TAHs, uh, we've had an 80% success rate to uh, bridge the transplant and uh, discharge home. So uh, we've kind of been pretty aggressive, thanks to uh, one of our surgeons who's, uh, uh, who's very, um, who enjoys uh, putting in the TH as a, uh, it's a great device and you've obviously seen the benefits from that. So, but it takes this person in the background to always hammer in the fact, you know, what about TH? Is this a time to do it? And I think that's, that's the most important part of your heart team is to also have this in the back of your mind where TH is a valuable option to get patients uh, out of temporary support uh, and get them to transplant in a much better condition. So I'll end here, and I will uh, ask Dr. Rame to field any questions. Dr. Liskowski, Mark, that was excellent. Um, and especially, I, I, I thought, you know, giving the whole body perspective, you know, we all focus on the heart, but then there's the issue of, you know, skeletal muscle. And just like you said, so catecholamine support, and I agree with you, I think it, it depletes, you know, muscle mass, but, but it also, we know it burns fat like crazy. I mean, you come back and see somebody after a month, they've been in the hospital on catecholamines and you can't recognize them sometimes because they've been so fat depleted and they probably remain low output, some of them. So yeah, I think, I think one question I have, we're waiting for some other questions from the audience. One question I have for you is, um, I mean, looking at the patient with the uh, VSD, that had an ischemic VSD that presented, uh, just briefly, did you end up uh, laying out a strategy of when you'd go to TH up front, or were you considering, I, I couldn't see if you were considering heart transplant after stabilizing initially on some peripheral platform. So uh, the patient came after a huge uh, infarct that was revascularized uh, fairly late, unfortunately, he was transferred from a peripheral center. Uh, and we have uh, one of our surgeons here who's sort of our local champ in, in closing the VSDs. Obviously, the first thing they tell us is, you know, call us in two weeks because they want the you know, tissues to sort of harden a little bit and become a little bit less mushy so you can close it a lot better. Uh, but right up front, just given the size of the VSD and the instability of this patient uh, in spite of a balloon pump, uh, you know, this is not a patient that we try to put an impella in because the VSD was so big, you know, I think quite easily we could have already had uh, sort of right to left uh, shunting. Uh, an ECMO uh, obviously was the, the way we sort of did acutely for this patient. But, uh, you know, we decided not to put this guy in ECMO for two or three weeks, waiting for him uh, to potentially get complications. So it was really the surgeons that told us, listen, this is really not something that can be closed easily. I think you really need an exit strategy. And we did have enough time to assess him as a, as a good transplant candidate. Uh, so we prefer to put in TH as opposed to waiting two weeks on ECMO or deciding to, to close it with a high risk or just bad uh, surgical yeah. result. That, I mean, that was such clean decision making because also... And a lot of us, you know, if, even a balloon pump where you think, you know, is going to minimally give you a right to left shunt, you could also, you know, create the imbalance of the, of the, of the pulmonary and, and, and systemic vascular resistance and you can get into trouble. So I think that that decision was, was to move forward with, with, with a platform that could just get you out of trouble completely. You know, we have Dr. Copeland on the line as well. And I'm just going to ask, because I remember visiting him years ago in Arizona, and, and again, you know, he was formulating back then some guidelines for, for the kind of patients that you really want to just focus on to give them the best chance to get them out of failure and quickly. I don't know if he can maybe comment a little bit 
will give us his input on this because I clearly believe BSD, the large ischemic BSD patients are, are definitely a substrate. Uh, the patients with refractory VT, as you had one as well. Um, and then obviously, um, you know, Jamie had a patient with, you know, recent onset heart failure, but uh, clearly, I mean, uh, after weeks of waiting for recovery, there was not even a signal. So I'm just curious if Dr. Copel can give us some insight uh, of how he sees the field now on that. Uh, yeah, I, I goofed around here. Somehow I've gotten out of the video of this. You can still hear me though, I guess. Um, I think uh, one of the things that has been brought home by both of these uh, gentlemen that presented and gave great case reports is that um, you can only wait so long in these patients once they go into cardiogenic shock. And you did that also, Eddie. I mean, uh, your, your uh, preamble to this was uh, essentially the same thing. And I, I've always said that uh, ECMO is a dying model or a dying uh, process and it's just a question of time. And I think he, he, you've all kind of mentioned that, that you can only wait four days or 10 days or not more than 10 days before things start going south so badly that uh, you just don't have an opportunity. And it's just a question of, uh, it's just a question of uh, what the disease process is and what the reversibility of that disease process is uh, uh, that determines whether you go ahead with a total heart or not. Uh, and uh, one of the things that struck me about uh, Jamie's presentation was, you know, how do you know how long to wait uh, on these patients that may have reversibility? I mean, what it, obviously you're on some type of support, but uh, you, uh, you uh, are, uh, you know, you're stuck because if you wait too long, then you've waited, you're not going to be able to do anything at all for the patient. So, I, you know, the question is, for Jamie is, uh, you know, what, what do you have any guidelines for that? I mean, do you try to wean and then if you can't wean after a certain period of time, what is that period of time? Uh, it kind of depends upon the, you know, the, the etiology. For postpartum, I don't think anyone knows for sure. But usually, if they're not coming back, or certainly if they, you know, with the, with her uh, her situation at six weeks, there was no recovery at all, and we tried to wean both the LVAT and the RVAT, percutaneous vats, and you know, no go, she crashed. So we were thinking about switching her to a TH, but we couldn't get approval. So we would have to go either to bilateral Centromax, or um, which nobody wanted to do, because uh, she looked so good with the device, you know, the percutaneous devices. Then of course that little increase in perch pressure and then followed by increase in current within Pella, we kind of knew we were in trouble. And uh, maybe we waited a little too long because she arrested, but that's the way it is. Yeah, well, I mean, I would agree with you. It's, it's, it's highly individual and it goes with, each patient is different. And, uh, but you ha always have to keep looking and asking that question, you know, is this heart really going to return or is this a transplant candidate uh, in those reversible patients? I mean, the last thing you want to do is transplant somebody that doesn't need a transplant. And they'll always do better with their own heart if it returns to normal function. But so many of these patients that we see coming in with cardiogenic shock, you know, they're just, they're not going to do it. And uh, I don't think there's any magical way to figure it out. You just have to get in there and put your feet at the bedside every day and check out the patient and, and try to make a decision uh, in that way. Thanks, Jack. It's a really yeah. good point. I remember when, uh, when coming down to visit you years ago, um, you know, and I saw the patients you'd implanted, it was clear to me that there were some patients that, and back then we really didn't have a, a you know, we didn't have even an idea how VA ECMO could be stretched beyond a week. I mean, we, we, we used VA ECMO as just literally a means of seeing if someone's neural status got better. Nobody was doing any ambulatory ECMO or otherwise. I mean, central VA ECMO was different, but, but peripheral VA ECMO, which is often used as a means of just, you know, sitting tight, not doing anything quote unquote invasive. But, but I definitely learned that um, back then, I think you have to make some hard decisions 
if someone is intermax, you know, three going on to two, but you still have the ability to, you know, with some degree of, of either a, a, a pharmacologic degree of unloading, just to give that patient a reprieve for several, for a day or two to plan the team. I think that's what I wanted to ask is, um, you know, it would be neat to ask the question, how many patients came to TAH without ECMO and, and how those patients uh, were decided upon, you know, with some kind of data behind it. Because I'm sure, I'm sure a good cardiac team like, um, you know, like Mark was uh, alluding to, can make a decision within a couple of days that, hey, this is not going to work if we're going to keep this patient on ECMO for too long. Yeah, well, in our day, um, we use very little ECMO. Uh, the typical use of ECMO would be uh, taking somebody who was, had severe dilated four chamber cardiomyopathy, had a cardiac arrest, put them on ECMO, and go straight to the operating room. And uh, or within hours, so we didn't wait very long. Uh, so every patient was in cardiogenic shock that got a total artificial heart or any kind of a device for that matter, whether it was a, a bivad uh, with external uh, ventricles or a, an LVAD. Uh, they were all in cardiogenic shock essentially. Uh, in those days because we were afraid to use these devices in anybody else. And, uh, you know, very fortunately, uh, the total artificial heart worked very well in, in most of those situations and better than, better in fact, than LVAD or uh, um, implantable or external LVAD. So uh, yeah, a, a short period of time, I think is, is, the, is the main message. Thanks, Jack. I have a question from Val Rakita. I don't know if, um, uh, Brock, do we just, do you want me to just summarize this question? I think, Val, if you want to clarify your question, then we have another question from Claudio Bravo. Val, you want to come on the line and clarify your question for, um, this is for both actually, and for, uh, for the whole, uh, for Dr. Copeland. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Val. Sure, thanks, Eddie. Um, th they're all great case presentations. It seems like the common theme, it's a lot of acute presentations and the TH is being implanted, you know, while they're still inpatient. And are, are all these patients formally considered transplant candidates at the time of TH implant, or is there some question to their candidacy and, you know, it's being implanted without knowing completely if they're truly going to be a bridge to transplant? I know there's only an indication as of now for uh, BTT patients. Yeah. Um, I can answer for CEDARS. The majority of our patients who get uh, uh, implanted with a TH have to be um, run by the selection committee and accepted for transplant just because, you know, uh, it's the right thing to do, but uh, the insurance won't cover it if it's not. Um, now that it's available as DT, I'm not too sure how that factors into things, but in general, you have to do that evaluation before you put a TH in, otherwise it may be a bridge to nowhere. Yeah, here in Canada, we don't have any, uh, fortunately, any insurance or regulatory issues that really prevent us from putting it in. We just go to the storage room, take something off the shelf and put it in. Um, but I think, you know, we don't have the experience of sending patients home. And typically if we did put a TH in, they will get transplanted within, you know, worst case, you know, three to four months, uh, you know, typically in hospital. Um, so, and again, we don't think it's probably the best option for sending patients at this point in our experience locally uh, with TH. Uh, so we'll typically, you know, have the heart team quickly, you know, within the first 48 hours, see if they're transplant candidates, the surgical team will see if there's anything they can do to either repair uh, or allow the heart to recover. And our ICU, teams, our ICU team will sort of decide, you know, are they improving on temporary support and what is our window of opportunity? So we really have everybody working side by side and we have a plan within 48 hours for most people in terms of, okay, these are options, uh, A, B, C, let's see if he recovers and what's our next step. Hi, I Francisco you, uh, Rabia, just joining late. Hey, Francisco. Hi, hey. Francisco. <laughs> Hello, guys. So, yeah, we just did a, a TAH two days ago as a bridge to candidacy approved by the insurance company after we discussed it with them. So there is, there is room to move uh, when you discuss it with insurance companies. Uh, this was an Intermax 2 patient with a long history of drug abuse and rehabilitation that we wanted to make sure that he was full, he's fully re recovered prior to going to transplant. So they gave us the approval like that. We, we have received several already bridge to candidacy. So it, it's possible. Yeah, no, and I wanna just add a case that actually Francisco and Jack helped us with at Penn. 
You remember this case of a lady who was um, a CHOP patient who had a transplant 20 years ago and this really, I think it was bad humoral, but also like just CAV that just didn't look bad on Kath. I think she had really bad CAV, um, had a very horrible heart, stiff heart. Um, and she was on VA ECMO and unfortunately um, developed, uh, a, she had a spinal infarct on VA ECMO. So this lady ended up recovering on a total artificial heart over two and a half, three years almost. She actually began to walk. We were going to send her to you, Jamie. Remember her very well. Um, we would not transplant her because we wouldn't desensitize her at Penn, which is a shame. But uh, but but we, we, we've had not great experience how to desensitize. We wanted experts like Cedars and others to do this. Um, and this young woman got, you know, the courage she had and everything. She had a good quality of life on the total heart. She, she really touched a lot of people, but she ultimately succumbed to sepsis, uh, you know, short of trying to get her transplant. Uh, we were also looking at uh, centers like in Florida, because, you know, centers where she could have family to go to. <laughs> but yeah, she, she was uh, a three, almost three years, I believe, uh, on the total heart. Wow, she was young, right? Really young. Very young. Yeah, yeah. it's good to be young. She was also... Um, Unbelievably, I mean, the spinal infarct, I mean, I mean, she started walking towards the end uh, with almost no assistance. It was just unbelievable to see that. Yeah, and she, she was a case that I think she was on ECMO for about at least six weeks. She was. She was. She was Christian's patient. I wish he was on to discuss it. Yeah. Really, re really tough case, but I mean, he gave her the best chance. And, and just to, to answer Val, Val, we had not vetted her for transplant, even though we thought she could be a bridge to candidacy because we would not desensitize her. She was very sensitized coming into, uh, you know, when we were evaluating her on VA ECMO, very sensitized. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, there's one other question here, uh, Francisco. Well, and then uh, Jack, while we have you, we have Claudio asking uh, two questions. In regards to the patient who had AMR, pre-heart transplantation, he asked, does a TH sensitize patients as much or as, depending on your opinion, as the LVAD does? And two, is there any data that patients undergoing heart transplant off the TH do better than those bridged with ECMO? Excellent questions. Those are great questions. Um, Jamie or Mark or Francisco or Jack, uh, anyone else? So I think there's, a, there's, a, there's some data showing clearly that uh, after LVAD, people are more sensitized. Uh, are the bodies actually really pathogenic or is it just sort of nonspecific antibodies because people are acutely inflammatory? Uh, a lot of these patients, if you sort of check how, uh, whether antibody titers, are, antibody titers are with a C1Q, more specific uh, complement activating, or you recheck their PRAs uh, uh, a couple of weeks, a couple of months later, sometimes that changes quite a bit. Uh, so it's unclear exactly uh, how pathogenic those antibodies are up front. Uh, for TH, I suspect it's about the same process. You know, you get a sternotomy, you get lots of blood products, you get foreign material put in. Um, one of our patients had an LVAD recently and exactly ended up going from like a 10% PRA to 100% PRA. Uh, and just to re retest her soon to sort of see if that goes down. Um, we've had pretty good success going from TAH to, uh, uh, to transplant. Um, I think we tried putting an LVAD into a patient with biventricular dysfunction uh, just last week and he ended up needing an RVAD, then he lost his kidneys and then he had to be sedated. And so it was just a total mess. And I think we regret not having gone to TH upfront for this guy last week. Uh, fortunately, he got transplanted two days ago and he's doing fine. But uh, you know, we lost the kidneys in the process and we may not have uh, lost him had we gone to TH with just one major surgery upfront instead of serial procedures and you know, shock and recovery and shock and recovery. So uh, I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, what, uh, uh, how the patient's doing and not, you know, not uh, escalate and de-escalate and escalate. So uh, that's what our, th our thoughts are. Yeah, our patients who went electively to TH, no MCS before that, um, the overall survival or success to transplant is about 65, 70% 60. or so. If you get VA ECMO between, that survival goes down to about 48%. Uh, we did 25 patients via ECMO to TH, and about 12 of the 25 went to uh, transplant successfully, but it definitely is less. And then if you look at the best, best part of it all, though, is once you have a patient who's on TH and stable and optimized, if they go to transplant, the one-year survival after transplant, <clears throat> in our experience, has been 91%, which is almost like somebody coming off the street. 
So I'm not worried about the sensitization about the uh, the pH. Yeah, let me add, that's a great question. On the, what I have found over the years is that the pH itself do not increase the antibodies. It is the blood products that they receive at the time of the implantation, especially platelets. And we have had several patients that they, the PRA will go up and come down. But it, we did find at Cedars, and you can correct me, Jamie, is <clears throat> for all the devices, the non-HLA goes up. Yep. And where, we're, where we now are doing for any device patient that we're gonna transplant, DAH or ELVA, if they have a PRA, we will check non-HLA antibodies. Yeah. And if they have AT1R that is high, for example, or endothelia, we might consider uh, plasma phoresis right at the time of the transplant. So we don't have a problem. That is what we have found, but the, the class one and class two HLA, I have not seen those just go up because of the DA. It's when there is a lot of transfusion of blood products. Yep. I want to thank everybody. Brock, do we have two more minutes? There's one last question that is interesting. I'm sure there's going to get a lot of different viewpoints, but what is the time frame? I don't want to uh, take up people's times here. Uh, there's another question by the, by the, by, uh, the participant here. I sincerely appreciate everybody's time thus far. Um, we can keep the webinar open as long as people want to discuss, but I understand if, if people need to drop off, um, I thank everyone for being here. So if we'd like to address that question by all means, please. Yeah, well, anyway, thanks everyone. If you have to come off, uh, this has been great. Thanks, Jamie, Mark, and it's great to see Dr. Copeland and uh, obviously Francisco. Mm -hmm. The question is actually if there's any change in the post-implant management now that there is no Nasiratide available commercially. <laughs> This is a very interesting question that Val asks because of, uh, you know, some of the hiccups that some of us had with Nasiratide. Interestingly, we try to learn from Dr. Copeland and others, Francisco, you as well, in which there was less Nasiratide dependence across many centers, depending on the experience. Whoever wants to answer that, I'm not sure. I'm sure you can find Nasiratide in Canada, right, Mark? Uh, probably one of the Canadian pharmacies. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's generic. You can pick it up at the gas station, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, it's interesting because we have encountered that in the last several of the ages that we have done when we have no niceritide available. And what we have done is a combination of either UF ultrafiltration or CRT to maintain the, the volume at a normal range and give time, enough time for the kidneys to recover. And we have done that intermittently in the last few patients without niceritan and we have recovered renal function. So you just maintain uh, euvolemia uh, and adequate electrolyte balance for those first few days, if necessary, with UF and CRT, and we've been able to, to get through it. And actually, that's the way we used to do it long before we were using niceritan. Thank you so much. I think that's going to be a great research question using a historical control of before and after the seer type. Maybe yes. there's no difference. Thanks sure. everyone. I appreciate everyone's time. Brock, I'll leave it up to you if you want to close or the team. The only thing left to say is thank you to everybody that was here. I, I sincerely appreciate you carving out the time to our presenters, to Dr. Rami, Dr. Maraguchi, Dr. Leskowski. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Um, for anybody who would like to share this after the fact, we will be putting up a uh, recorded version of this. Um, and again, I thank everybody for your time. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. See you guys. Thank you, Walter. Bye-bye. See you later. Take care.